Hey guys, what's up? I'm Erin and welcome back to the channel. I recently read a book called Die With Zero, getting all you can from your money and your life. And honestly, I don't think I've ever been more conflicted while reading a book. The overarching theme of the book is that money is meant to be spent. In order to live your life as efficiently as possible, you spend. Spend on things you enjoy, spend on people that you love, spend to simply get the most possible enjoyment out of life. Money sitting in a bank account doesn't actually do you any good. In fact, it's wasteful. Rather, you should aim to die with zero, that is, to spend all your money. If you die with anything greater than zero, it represents missed opportunities, missed adventures. So really, to live your life to the fullest, you should aim to die with zero and spend all your money. The author puts forth a few rules. Rule number one, maximize your positive life experiences. At the end of the day, what makes a life well lived is a life full of experiences. And I think we can all agree that a life full of positive experiences is a really great thing. Rule two, start investing in experiences early. And by early, he means right now. Don't put your experiences off for the future. If you're the type of person who's dreamed of going to Europe, don't say you'll go one day, instead, Take that trip right now. If you've dreamed of hiking the Appalachian Trail, take a month off work and go do it now, at least while you have your health. He argues that doing these experiences now pays you dividends for a lifetime, adding more joy to your life. Rule number three, aim to die with zero. Yes, that's the name of the book, but it's also one of the rules. And if you die with anything more than zero, well, you've kind of messed up. Let's say you die with $100,000 in the bank account. Let's say you worked a job up until your retirement that paid you $50,000 a year. Well, if we wanna look at it from the perspective of saving $50,000, that means you wasted two years of your life at work. You literally worked for free because you took this money, parked it in a bank account, and never did a thing with it. Alternatively, you could have retired earlier, or you could have simply spent the money on doing things that brought you joy. If you die with this money in the bank account, well, you really wasted life energy. And if you were making money at the rate of $50,000 a year and you die with $100,000 in the bank account, you wasted two years of life energy, according to the author. Number four, use all available tools to help you die with zero. Use a life expectancy table to see how long you're likely to live, look at the family members that came before you, look at any potential health issues, and then, you guessed it, get to spending accordingly. Of course, the author does note that it's very unlikely that you would actually die with zero, but the goal is to get as close as possible. Number five, give money to your children or charity when it has the most impact. Okay, now just because the author suggests that you should die with zero does not mean that he's suggesting you shouldn't give any money to your kiddos or to your favorite charities, but rather he suggests that you should give it now, give it today, give it while you're alive. Your charities are likely to greatly benefit from your donation today rather than waiting, say, 20 or 30 years. And as far as your kids, he argues that giving money to them when they're, say, 30 is far more impactful than giving it to them when they're 50 or 60, which are actually very common ages for inheritances. When your kids are in their late 20s or their early 30s, they likely still have student loan debt. Maybe they just bought a home. Maybe they just had kids. They likely have a lot of financial stress and receiving an inheritance at this point in their life could relieve a lot of those financial pressures. However, if you wait until you pass away to give your money to your kids, they might be 50 or 60 years old. At that point in life, they might have their finances figured out a little bit more. Money probably isn't as tight. And while of course they would welcome an inheritance at this point, it may not be as impactful as if they were to have received the money when they were at a time that was pretty financially stressful in those younger years. 
I actually think there's a lot of merit to this. I remember when I was in my early 20s and my grandpa passed away, I was speaking with the funeral director and he was telling me that he kind of thought much along these lines. He said that his job taught him a lot about what truly matters in life and it was friends and family. So he said it was his goal to help his kids as much as possible while he was alive so he could watch them enjoy life. And I remember being profoundly impacted by his words, looking at him and I'm like, wow, you you have this figured out. Yes, that's a great lesson. And I'm very fortunate in that I belong to a family that looks at life much in this manner. My parents want to help out their kids as much as possible. And then that's my brother and I, we turn around and we're like, you guys worked your entire life to get where you are. Please spend, please enjoy it. We don't need your help. So we're all constantly fighting to try and help each other as much as possible, which is a really blessed situation to be in. I get that. So overall, I really love this sentiment. I love the idea of helping when you can and helping where you can. But I also have a side of me that's pretty cautious and I understand the fear of running out of money and that is a very real concern for many retirees. So I would definitely caution people against giving more than they think they're capable of because the worst thing you could do is run out of money in retirement. There's no loan for retirement, so you don't wanna give away absolutely everything because you wanna make sure that you absolutely have a cushion to fall back on. So up until this point, I've had a lot of agreement with this author. I really think that you should be living your life to its fullest. Money is a tool, it is meant to be spent, so use it to live the life of your dreams. But here's where some of my issues with the book start. The author then goes on to take it one step further and he says failing to give while you're alive is actually selfish. You can be generous only when you are alive, when you actually have choices and their consequences. If you give generously when you're alive, then I consider you selfless. If you're dead, you just don't have that choice. He basically says your money has to go somewhere when you die, you can't take it with you, so you can't really be seen as generous or selfless at that point. It's just a simple fact that the money has to go somewhere. I think that attitude's a little extreme. You can't look at someone who passes away and gives, say, $800,000 to a cancer research fund and say, well, actually, they weren't really being generous because they greedily held on to that money until the very end. They would have been generous had they given it during their lifetime. And I think that's kind of harsh and unwarranted, but that is the attitude that he puts forth in the book. Number six, don't live your life on autopilot. There are three items you must strive to balance and make the most of, health, money, and time. When you are young, you have a lot of health and a fair amount of time, but generally not a lot of money. When you're middle-aged, you have a bit more money, but you have less time as you have more life obligations and a bit less health than when you were in your 20s. When you're retired, you likely have a lot of time and a lot of money, but less health. In fact, this is one of the author's main arguments throughout the course of the book. He argues that once you hit your late 20s, your health starts to decline, which is why you really need to just spend and enjoy those experiences while you have your health. And I look at this as a somewhat extreme take. I mean, yes, somebody who's in their 20s has more vibrant health than say someone in their 70s, but I also don't look at people as once they get to 50, 60, 70 as just stopping their enjoyment of life. I think part of it is our responsibility to take care of our health so that we can have many years of great experiences ahead of us. And I think it's important to note that no matter what age you are, there are different ways to enjoy life. So I don't really like this extreme take. And then when it comes to saving money when you're young and you have a smaller paycheck, the author actually has some pretty interesting words, so I wanted to just read that from the book. It's crazy to save 20% of your income when you're young and you have good reason to expect to earn much more in the next few years. It can even make sense to borrow money, spending more than you're currently earning when you expect to earn a lot more down the road. What the actual heck? Seriously, like seriously, I have no words. 
You know what? I do have words. That's ridiculous. Spend more than you're currently earning? That's called going into debt. That's stupid. Let's not do that. Oh, and another thing. Have you heard of compound interest? Putting away even a small amount when you're young can have a profound and enormous impact on your future life. Why would you waste that time? When I read that sentence, I almost dropped the book. Never have I seen such terrible advice written in black and white. Borrow more, spend more, save less. That's ridiculous. Just know, like, I need to take a minute. That really is terrible advice. People should not go around telling others to spend more than they're currently making. I think that gets people into a lot of financial trouble. And this was part of the reason I had such a difficult issue with this book. Rule number seven, think of your life as distinct seasons. Okay, I think we've all heard of a bucket list. Before you die, you make a list of all the things you want to accomplish or do before you kick the bucket. And a lot of people make a bucket list when they're faced with their own mortality or when they feel like the end is near. And in this sense, a bucket list can kind of be seen as reactionary. But the author of Die With Zero presents something that's a little more proactive. He suggests dividing your life into time buckets. I thought this was a really clever idea. You divide your life into five to 10 year increments and start to list the items you would like to accomplish in those years. Writing down your goals can make them far more likely to happen. This can help you plan your life and fit the items that you truly want to accomplish into your life. Certain goals are more likely to happen at certain ages and taking this bird's eye view and long range approach can help set you up for a lifetime of meaningful experiences. And it can help to periodically reassess your goals from time to time. It's your life. Don't be afraid to make adjustments. Rule number eight, know when to stop growing your wealth. Remember the author's whole mindset is that you only need money insofar as to pay for your life and the experiences you want to have. Once you reach that point, you can step away from your job. He says if you continue to work past that point, you're actually wasting your life. He also goes on to say you can claim that you love your job, but you probably don't. But even if you do say you really love your job and you want to continue working, it is your duty to up your spending in order to counteract those extra earnings. That way you can still aim to die with zero. In fact, the author even goes on to argue that extremely wealthy people like Bill Gates have wasted their time and their life accumulating so much wealth, as in they'll never be able to actually spend it within their own lifetime. But I think that's an unfair judgment. I don't really think an outsider can look at someone else's life and act as the judge and jury deciding if they've wasted their life. Whether Bill Gates has a well-lived life or not, that's really only up for him to decide. And there are truly people who love their job, even extremely wealthy people who love their job. Warren Buffett has famously said, I'll keep working until about five years after I die. And I've given the directors a Ouija board so they can keep in touch. Of course that's a joke, but he certainly isn't working because he needs the money. He's working because he loves his job. And a lot of people don't work specifically and only for a paycheck. Yes, of course, a paycheck is the primary motor that the vast majority of us actually are working for, but a lot of people get personal fulfillment and a lot of great satisfaction from the job that they do. The author's primary argument is that people save far too much money for far too late in life, that they're just hoarding their money. They should be spending it when they're younger, when they have the opportunity to enjoy these experiences more. And doing this is just kind of wasteful. And what are you gonna do with a giant nest egg when you're older? You probably likely don't have your health, so you probably can't do much to enjoy experiences and spend your money anyhow. Though it's the author's viewpoint, not mine, please don't shoot the messenger. Also, the author goes on further to say you shouldn't really worry about medical expenses once you get older, because likely you wouldn't be able to afford it anyhow. You're gonna need the government or Medicare to pay for it. Again, author's words, not mine. Author also goes on to elaborate, if you're concerned about running out of money in retirement, you always have options. You can downsize your home, take out a reverse mortgage, or even invest in annuities. 
I would like to add that I really like the idea of downsizing your home when you get older, but if you're gonna suggest options like a reverse mortgage or an annuity, you really wanna put a big ol' asterisk on that one because those come with a lot of risk. Yes, there's benefit, but they do have some downside. So you do want to cover that if you're going to suggest that to people. Again, on this, really big asterisk on that. I just think if you're gonna suggest some things that come with some really big downsides, you definitely wanna discuss the positives and the negatives, not just willy-nilly suggest, yeah, sure, take out a reverse mortgage or put it all in annuity, you'll be fine. Sure, these investment vehicles certainly have their place, but you definitely need to know all sides of it before you consider it. And finally, rule number nine, take your biggest risks when you have little to lose. AKA, the author says you need to do this when you're young. You wanna quit your job and start your own business? You wanna move across the country? Heck, move to a different country? Do it now. Don't say you will do it one day. If you don't do it today, you likely will never do it. As time goes on, life gets infinitely more complicated. You get a family, you get a mortgage, you get tied down. So take the chance when you're young. If you don't do it now, you likely will never do it. You'll have too much at stake. It's hard to risk it all on a brand new business when you have mouths to feed at home. It's much easier when you're sleeping in your parents' basement and you don't have a lot at stake. Don't delay, take those chances while you have the chance because if you wait, you might end up with just missed opportunities. I truly did feel like I was having a personal crisis while reading this book. There would be segments where I would read them and I'm like, yes, absolutely, this is amazing advice. And then there would be other segments that I would read them and I'm like, oh my gosh, no, this is the worst. Why would you ever say that? But in the end, I actually really loved the book because I love books that challenge my beliefs. And believe it or not, I actually think this book was written for people like me and for people who watch this channel. I know the people who watch this channel are financial fanatics because when I post a video talking about wealth and percentiles, every comment left is like, I'm in the 90th percentile, the 95th percentile, the 99th, which is amazing. I know you're super savers. But us super savers, we can benefit from advice like this. Saving is great, building wealth is great, but it's important to keep in mind that money is just a tool, a tool you should use to build the life of your dreams. Don't be so hyper-focused on building wealth that you forget to spend. Spend on building the life that you want. Spend on freeing up your time. Spend on things that bring you joy. You should be spending on the things that make your life worth living because at the end of the day, Saving and investing, that's only half the equation. The other portion is to spend wisely. And every once in a while, us super savers, we need a little reminder of that. So at the end of the day, I'll call this a good book with some questionable pieces of advice that I can't really get past. <laughs> but that's gonna do it for me today, guys. I hope you enjoyed this one. If you got anything at all out of it, please give it a like on your way out. If you're new here, please consider subscribing, or if you know of anyone who might benefit from this type of content, please consider sharing. I hope you have a great one, and I'll see you next week. Bye.